2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in the first verse. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is a reading from God's holy word. Please be seated. How strong are the words of the apostle? The warnings. You know, we are... Living in an age in the Western Hemisphere where there is a war on the word. There's a war on the word. And when you think of war, you're usually thinking of an aggressive person, a, a pirate with, with one eye patched. You're always looking at a villainous creature. But let's remember, Satan and his servants have one tendency. They seem to be subtle, right? Cunning, charming. Any way to, in order you to move from God's word to themselves. Folks, we have more churches per capita than any other nation in the world. Where are the saints? Where's the salt? What's, what's going on? Have we thought about this? Have we really considered you could walk downtown and three, four blocks, you've already encountered two, two, three churches. You know, you got Google that you can search whatever you want. And if you'll notice what they're using to bring people to them. You know, I did a Google search on churches just in Clarksville. And you know what I noticed? I noticed some pages that you go on, you have uh, a whole line of people in a band, all lined up. Reminds me of We Are the World with Michael Jackson and all that, and they're all standing up, and they're all singing, they got the band. Then you got some with lights, you got some with two arms in the air, you got some with one arm in the air. Now let's ask ourselves a question. Do you think Peter, Bartholomew, James did that? You think the first century all the way up to the 19th century did these things? You notice what's going on? You see the culture is, the environment of the culture is about entertainment? This isn't even, this is, it's, it's affecting all the pulpits. You know, when you look at the contemporary church, just, just looking at them, the word is not the central point of the worship. When the reformers sought to reform the church, they moved the pulpit from the side because the Roman church and the Church of England was doing what? It was more about the liturgy, more about the show, more about the clothing, the incense, and everything else because that has a natural appeal to flesh. Today, it's more about the entertainment. I could not discern the difference between that and the Ryman Auditorium when they're advertising. I couldn't discern it. Is this, is this a rock concert? You know, then you have these preachers that are going about and they're doing a tour. 
And the tour thing it reminds me of the tours that they used to do for Donovan and for Arlo Guthrie and for uh, ACDC. It's just a big advertisement. He's doing a tour. Catch him here. Catch him here. The word is not the central point of worship. It's been replaced. When the pulpit goes, so does the church. When the church falls, sadly, look at the culture that we live in. Where is it today? The second thing that we see in, in the contemporary church, they tend to make followers of themselves. Because of the, the, the dynamic ability of preaching, I always wonder, how do you think Satan came to Eve? Did he say, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think... No, he came, I think, I think the illustration I used last week was, he came like a, a used car dealer in Boca Raton. He's going to sell you the bill of goods. He's going to market it. He's going to make you enamored to say, you know what, this person, there's no way this person can lie to me. He's so nice. He's so kind. And his words, I can relate to him. Another problem is the topical series rules with little or no use of context or scriptural references. It's a topical series. Whatever they want to preach about, they do. The tendency is, like we had a, a situation where, you know, we're, when I'm not here, we're going through the book of Luke. How is it that some say, I don't preach exegetically? Would you do that to your, a, a letter from your parents? I'm only going to pick out the, the words I want to hear. We don't do that there. The sermon text usually serves for a launching pad for the favorite topics or stories geared to move emotions. Sermons are geared to gain numbers at the expense of doctrine. Why? Well, in the turn of the century, what was the battle cry for the progressives and the liberals? Doctrine divides. What does God say? There needs to be division. There needs to be heresies. Why? So that, that, that those who have the truth can be recognized. In the contemporary church, they avoid the past. But for a good reason. They share no unity with Christ's church over the centuries. So they lead people to think that they are the beginning and end of Christianity. See, people are searching. There's a lot of people searching. The number one person searched in Google is Jesus Christ. The number one search for a church, a Christian church, there's a search out there. But how are they marketing it in order to bring people to them? Well, first off, they tend to win you over by their personality, their dynamic motivational style preaching. They stick with the words and beliefs most Americans naturally believe in. They have a version of contextualization. It's dependent on the neighborhood. If you're in a conservative neighborhood, the flavor will be conservative. If you're in a progressive neighborhood, the sermon will be progressive. The church to them has become a business. Give the consumer what they want. Entertainment, smiles, building programs. Look at our family-friendly atmosphere at the expense of truth, depth, God. We have created the most superficial people who take the name of Christianity today in any, than any other time in history. In order to get by, they create a God that suits the American public. Their idea is make sure the customer is happy. Why? So they'll continue to buy our product. There was a song that came out many years ago on Broadway. Hollywood song. It says, let me entertain you. Let me make you smile. Let me do a few tricks, some old and then some new tricks. I'm very versatile. And if you're really good, I'll make you feel good. I'd want your spirit to climb, so let me entertain you. Hollywood has entered the pulpit in such a way that Steve Lawson said, shallow pulpit produces superficial people. Exposition is forsaken for entertainment. Theology has been forsaken for theatrics, and doctrine has been replaced by drama. Now, let's not just pick on them. 
let's pick on the reformed mind. All right. In the reform mind, they tend to make followers of the Reformation. They're consistently living in the past. Instead of making disciples of Jesus Christ, you're disciples of their particular favorite historian or church theologian. Instead of personality, they impress their audience with their skill of intellect. Example, and here's a good example. Look at Genesis chapter 1 with me quick. And I've seen this. And if there's anything that could oh, make me grow hair on my head, it's this. Okay? You know, the preacher will go up there and he'll spend 45 minutes on a word called day. One word, yam in Hebrew. And then he'll tell you that this word doesn't only mean 24 hours. It could mean a long period of time. See, what they did was they went to bed with the world and they're trying to fit the two in. Somebody's going to get pregnant. And it's usually the church. And they espouse a, an illegitimate child. So he enamors his audience with this one word. People start to walk out and say, you know, I never saw that. Boy, our pastor is so smart. How did, you know, I'm glad he gave me that. Now, you know what you just produced? A bunch of people are going to run out and tell everybody God didn't create the world in, seven, in six days. Wait a minute, time out. Context which was the battle cry of the Reformation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. There was light. God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. But here's what happens. When the person bought it, who do you think God does? Oh, shucks. No. You'll buy that man's teaching for the rest of your life. And you'll wrap yourself around the wisdom of man, not in the wisdom that comes from God. Also, the topical series rules. You know, what's amazing about the topical series with reformers, they've reduced the Bible. 66 books into 10 points. That's it. It's amazing. 66 books are now 10 points. But if you just realize that if you preach verse by verse through whole books, you're going to hit the points. But why do you isolate them? Because you want to make disciples of the Reformation. You want to make disciples of what their favorite thing. You know, you could tell what a pastor loves by what he talks about all the time. If he loves the history of the Reformation, you got a history guy. I want us to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength. And use history as a catapult to reform the age in which we're in and not die in the past. The sermon text serves for a launching pad for their favorite topics or their theological hobby horses. They all got them and they run with those races. Sunday, instead of a concert hall atmosphere, they create a classroom atmosphere. They inform the mind at the expense of moving the affections toward God. We've got to guard against that. We have to guard against that. Many speak so above their listeners that if a non-Christian walks in, it's not even in the modern dictionary. You know what Paul says about that? And this is what I love. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 to 5. The Apostle Paul, whom wrote the most letters, whom God used mightily, whom seems to be the most popular guy amongst the Reformers. They love what he teaches. I would beg that they would follow his example. He says this, When I come to you, brothers... And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. There's conversion. 
so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Oh, that my brothers would know this. And like I said before, they love to live in the past. And you'll notice, you know when they get the most excited? Where they're jumping around and all of a sudden the programs come out? October 31st. Reformation Day. It's amazing how you can sit there all year and hear messages how well the Roman Catholics honor this feast day and this feast day. What do you do? <laughs> well, you don't call it a feast day, man, but when Martin Luther's Day come out, you're all over the place. Reformation, put the banners out. And then the whole sermon is about him. Also, their preaching follows a, a, a road called the Via Negativa. Have you all ever traveled the Via Negativa? <laughs> Probably says, I've never heard of that. Only an Italian can figure out a road that uses a Latin term. They spend most of their lectures telling people what they're against. Preach the text, right? Preach the text. Instead of an inviting church, they build a compound, a dwindling and unapproachable bashing of stone-faced Reformed saints, and then wonder why no one from the world is coming to visit them. Check it out. I went back to a church that I used to go to years ago. Stagnant. Never, they don't believe in evangelism. They don't believe in outreach. And it seems that any time I visit, it's only Romans or Ephesians. Well, I went there, it was Romans. <laughs> and I was like, this is amazing. I wish I bet. I would have put, the money would have went from one pocket into the other pocket. And then I went downstairs and I was amazed. I thought Theodore Beza, John Calvin, Casper Olivanus came to life. They all had different beards. All sat in their collective places arguing about infralapsarian and supralapsarian. Both camps lost the purpose of preaching, folks. This is what I'm getting at. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why there are no conversions today. God wants us to preach for conversion. It gives the Holy Spirit the work when you're taking away the wisdom of man and not drawing people to the preacher. What's the word say? And the word will correct both the contemporary church and the Reformed church if perhaps God will grant them repentance. Because we've got people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, who don't know truth. It's upon us to get this message out there. And conversion begins with the gracious gift of a new life. And it gives rise to a genuine faith and a repentance that what? Continues the rest of your life. But how does it happen? Well, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, I charge you. It's a command. I charge you. And then notice he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. The first thing he's telling preachers, you are preaching in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge you. That's the reminder. And it's a solemn charge. And by his appearing in his kingdom, and then he says, preach. Preach what? The word. Not the word of man. Preach the word. That's important, the word. Because when he says, all scripture. And you notice the word scripture, it's singular. Because God's word is one in unity. Look at man, they got 9,000 denominations in one state. <laughs> Every flavor, everything. All scripture and only scripture could instruct correct. But how do we get there? Listen to how God tells us where to preach. So he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, whether it's convenient or not. Be ready at all times to proclaim his word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Notice that. Reprove, rebuke, exhort 
with complete patience. You know, when you look at the word reprove, to convict, refute, right? Rebuke, to admonish or charge sharply, to exhort, to console. What is the Lord telling us? Think about this. Tell, you know, one thing I want us to realize, folks, the pastors, the elders, right? The Lord wants us to speak as his representative. We're his ambassadors. That's serious. That's why when Paul says, I solemnly charge you. I solemnly charge you because we are serving as ambassadors for Christ. Not showmen, not entertainers, not trying to win people to show, hey, look at our church, look at our program. No. And an ambassador is to speak the very words of his king and not make up his own agenda. Where do we get that from? Well, the first thing we see is, see that word reprove? How does the king talk about reprove? Remember, reprove means that he's telling preachers we're to convict, refute, prove to be false, to call to account, show one's fault. Why? See, when you reprove, you're showing somebody's fault. Why? Not because you hate them. You love them. You want to drive them to the Savior. This is really the reason, folks. There's no other reason. We live in a world that says, it's not sin. It's an illness. Look it. Come on. We got to wake up. And then you got a world that won't talk about sin. I met an elder of a church in this, in this city. And he only left the other church because he likes the light show and he works the lights. I asked if they talk about sin. You know what he said? That's too negative. Are you kidding me? I wanted to pick him up and become a bouncer. I was ripped. Sorry. But I was ripped. How dare you take away the power of the cross and deceive the people in front of you? Are you crazy? You know, it, it was mind boggling. But let's go back to the scripture. How, do we, how does the ambassador know to reprove? Well, look what the Lord says in Proverbs 6.23. The commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. That's what our king tells us. Proverbs 10.17, whoever heeds instruction is on the path of life, but he who rejects reproof Leads others astray. You know what that means? You can't correct them. They're just there to lead others astray. Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. You don't want to be corrected? You're dumb. <laughs> That's what God is saying. And actually the word means you're like cattle and you're a brutish beast. Where do we get the idea of reproof? From God. Read Micah. Read Jeremiah. What did he do to his people? The next word is rebuke. To admonish or charge sharply. To tax with fault. To rate. To chide. To censor severely. Where do we hear that from? This is what the ambassador is supposed to do. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. Listen to the Lord God. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Same thing today. He says, ah, notice what he says, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evil doors, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? Your whole head is sick. 
from your whole heart is faint, from the sole of your foot even to your head. There's no soundness in it, but bruises, sores, and raw wounds that only, folks, the Lord Jesus Christ could heal. The entertainment business isn't going to preach that. But that's where we get, as ambassadors, to rebuke. But also notice the word exhort. To console, to encourage, and strengthen by consolation, to comfort. You can't take this one only and eliminate the other two. If you don't cut the flesh and put the alcohol in it, you're not going to drive them to get it, wash it out. The consolation comes from the Lord God again in Isaiah. And I purposely picked Isaiah to show you that he reproves the people. He rebukes the people. But he also says this in Isaiah 40, 29. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. What did Paul say? My grace is sufficient for you. Even youths, youths, I say it like an Italian, right? Youths <laughs> shall faint and be weary, and young men will fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hosea 14.1, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Son, daughter, because you did this, you fell, but I love you. You see, this is, this is how we're to preach. This is how you convert souls. This is how you show faithfulness to the Lord God. He says in Romans 2, 4, Do you presume on the riches and kindness and forbearance and patience of God, not knowing that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That word is, was, was taken out. Now it's just a matter of recognizing. That's all. We just recognize. I can recognize my sin all day. That doesn't mean I turned around and walked away from it. I see it. But, I, but, the, but the Lord says, repent from it. Now notice what he says in the next line. Verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. See the word sound teaching? That's that straight line of teaching that systematic theologians say the Bible only tells one truth. From A all the way to Z, from alpha to omega, from beginning to end. And that sound teaching goes back to what he says in verse 2. Preach the word. So where's the sound teaching come? The word. Not the illustrations, not the pastor's life story, not his fishing trips, not his visions, not his dreams. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. What do they replace it with? They have itching ears and they're going to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. What do you think Satan did? Let me entertain you. Let me give you a history lesson. Let me show you how to cut your beard. Let me show you how to walk like Calvin or think like... You know, when you read the men who wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith and just read their sermons, they don't sound anything like the ones who adhere to the Presbyterian document of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Just listen to them. Compare them. Just compare them. You know what they do? They follow this. And if they were alive today to see what we look like, they would say, you're illegitimate children. And I'm not using the King James translation on that one, but you know what I mean. Illegitimate. Because instead of standing up and reforming the culture we're in, they're talking about what they did 500 years ago. They're dead. Those are dead horses. He says this. Verse 4, they will turn away from listening to the truth. The truth goes back to the sound teaching. The sound teaching 
goes back to preach the word. You see how you exegete that passage? You go back. He says, as for you, be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Endure suffering. You know, folks, when you, do, when you preach the way God wants you to preach, there's consequences. This is what it says in, in um, the consequences for it. Amos chapter 5, verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks the truth. People don't want that. Everybody wants to be friends. Everybody wants to make friends. Are they greedy? Are they in it for their self? Are they fearful? Are they cowards? In the book of Revelation, at the final day of judgment, who were the first people cast out of the kingdom of heaven? The cowards. The cowards. You know how easy it is to hide in the catacomb of a church building and not go out and talk to the people out in the streets? And then talk to like-minded people? You're not going to catch no slack. Especially if you're giving them a chronic history lesson. You know, we need to understand something. And turn me to 2 Timothy, just to help you understand this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, just to show you this whole epistle. 2 Timothy 1, 13, 14, he says, follow the pattern of sound words. Again, it's a reminder. Where are we going to get the sound words? Preach the word. That's it, preach the word. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Not me, the apostle. In the faith and love that are in who? The person, Jesus Christ. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And then he says, guard the good deposit. So this pattern of sound words, right? This pattern of sound words, which he says, preach the word. He tells the rebuke, reprove, exhort. He talks about it being sound teaching. He calls it the truth. He also says, guard it. He says, guard it. We got to guard it. Consequence number two, 2 Chronicles 36, 16. Here's why they don't. But they kept mocking the messengers of God. You know, those men who wrote the Westminster Confession, they suffered. Imagine working a whole year, expecting your pay that following Monday, and the government came in and says, no, you lost your church, and we're keeping your pay. What do you think they did? They went out and preached in the woods. They went out and preached. They continued their task. What do you think we would do today? Look for another job or hide in some cousin's house 500 miles away. They kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets. Anything new? What does Ecclesiastes say? There's nothing new under the sun. But what does he say? Until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people and there will be no remedy. If you really love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. If you don't, the wrath of God is just waiting. And if we can't see it heading into that direction, we're blinded to. We're blinded to. Jeremiah 36.3 It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. He'll bring it on. His people will repent. But how many will be lost? How many will suffer and scream? How many will curse the preacher who told them, you won't be here, you're going to be raptured. <laughs> the biggest lie. Second Timothy 3, 10, 14, and 16. To close this out, I want you to hear these words. Paul says, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, 
See, that's important. Remember when, when we talked about Paul said, when I came to you to preach, I didn't speak with words of wisdom? You get somebody that comes in here and you're getting 10 points, <laughs> you know, remind them of something. And you're hearing these big words that me nor cash could figure out what they mean, right? What do we got to do? I want to know his conduct and his teaching. Don't separate the two. My aim in life, what was Paul's aim in life? To make Christ known, to give the whole counsel of God, not just 10 points. My faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. As for you, continue what you have learned. The word, right? And have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able, able, only the sacred writings, only the scripture, are able to make you wise for salvation. Not stories and not history. And it's through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, to train in righteousness. 2 Timothy 2, 2, 5, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. That's how you ordain them. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Share in suffering as a good soldier. Of who? Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. How are we to compete? And what is our rule book? The Word of God. That's it. The Word of God. Folks, unconverted churches filled the land. The proof is there's no conversion, there's no Christ-like believers in the pulpit or in the pews. There is no longer a distinction between the people of God and the people of the world. The remedy is tell these illegitimate human beings, get back to the word. Warn the people who go to their churches and say, hey, read it. Don't take my word for it. I'm just reading this. The person's afraid? Don't be afraid. Because you're the first list that's out the gate. God don't make cowards. We've been enlisted in the army of God. We're disciples. We're a church that wants to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Totally dependent upon him and his grace. You will suffer. You will endure hardship. But what greater joy than to endure for just this little period of time some hardship from your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, the government, your friends, other enemies, and have eternity with the one who suffered for you. Amen.